Hi, I'm here with Henry Chamberlain. He has an upcoming graphic novel, George's Run. It is about the uh, career of George Clayton Johnson, a science fiction writer that um, you have seen their work. And so the book comes out May 12th in the bookstores and May 17th in the comic book stores. And without further ado, I have Henry here. Henry, thank you for coming on and having a chat with me. Oh, well, thank you so much, Ray, for, for doing this. I uh, am so uh, thrilled to have this book out. It's uh, just a, a few weeks away. I mean, it's uh, May 12th when it comes out. And it, it's, uh, I feel like it's already April now, but uh, I wanted to show you, this is a, a cover it's not the final cover. It's pretty close to what it's going to look like. Uh, they they changed yeah. they changed this part. And, is it the, uh, is it the same typography or is it different? It's the same typography, but but uh, Rutgers cleaned it up, and uh, they they did they did a lot of of uh, the layout improvements, which I, I just blows me away. It's Rutgers University Press, and I'm just so so grateful for you guys for for seeing. Uh, that this this uh, as a gem is something that's useful and entertaining. It's about George Clayton Johnson. He was a screenwriter, and he wrote during uh, the timing. Timing is everything. He wrote for all the, the great TV shows of the golden era of TV in, in the fifties. And uh, you can just name any show from that era. Uh, I, maybe not the Donna Reed show, but Alfred Hitchcock presents uh, mm -hmm. Route sixty six, uh, Honey West. And then the ones that are the ones that are the iconic, uh, these these are the real serious uh, contributions are from the Twilight Zone, the original Twilight Zone. So some of the most famous episodes, uh, if, if you think of the Twilight Zone, you, you will be thinking of George. And uh, he wrote for Star Trek. He wrote the very first episode ever broadcast of Star Trek. He co-wrote uh, Logan's Run, which is a cult classic novel. The novel itself is a, is a must read. And it was just reissued. Uh, and of course, there's the movie that came out in 1976. And uh, I uh, was at a function. It was a tribute to Richard Alf, uh, one of the co-founders of Comic-Con. And there, there was George. This was 2012. And he just uh, was given such an amazing introduction. I thought, my god, this man's been everywhere and done everything. And then to hear the man talk and, and uh, it just left an impression on me and i thought i've got to interview him and so i did i did some podcast interviews with him like we're doing now and mm -hmm. and i got to meet him at his home and i finally worked up the courage and i, I said can what do you think about uh, my doing a graphic novel about your life and times and he said go for it do whatever you want use creative license just go for it and so i ended up doing just that that's great i'm glad he was gracious with that um you know, just saying, you know, giving, respecting the freedom that he had, I guess, and then saying, you need that same freedom to create what you want to do. That's good. You know, it's not, he's not, he wasn't protective of that. Yeah. And I actually had uh, gotten to draw some of the pages ahead of time. So he got to see them. Okay. And I, 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 I evoked, I depict that in, in the graphic novel. I, I, I tried to, I tried to create a, a book that, that I would like to read where, I'm such a quirky little guy. I love politics. I love so many things. And this is very nerdy, but part of the framework I had in mind for, for this book was uh, Frost Nixon. I don't know if you saw that movie. I've never David, saw that. I didn't see oh, that movie. You, you would love it. David Frost interviews Richard Nixon. I'm familiar with the interviews. And uh, the movie version, oh, God. It just, it's these two flawed characters because David Frost was a very flawed individual in, in, in a way. Uh, he was a little bit too show busy and he wanted to become more legitimate and serious. That's That was his motivation for interviewing Nixon. Of course, Nixon wanted to present himself as best as, as he could possibly present himself. So anyway, I, that was in the back of my mind. This has nothing to really do with Frost Nixon, but the actual graphic. No, novel. but I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. But just the idea of, of, of me coming in my motivations, my baggage, whatever, and George with his life. And we're, we're both in a conversation and it just goes from there. And then we go into all these flashbacks and these dream sequences. That's the kind of stuff I want to read. And I, I, I think, like we were talking earlier before we started the interview, it has to be something compelling that just 
hits you it, it, in your heart. This is what you need to contribute. And I think it's, I'm, I'm just certain that's going to resonate with readers if they get a chance to read it. Yeah, I am. Um... I will admit that I am a huge Twilight Zone fan. I'm a big Star Trek fan. If I'm not that era, I love. And I and I know so many of the writers just by name, like Richard Matheson, Charles Beaumont, um, from Twilight Zone. Um, but I, I really almost felt bad that I wasn't familiar with George Clayton Johnson because he, he, he contributes so many great stories. Um, you mentioned Kick the Can, a game of pool that had Jack Klugman and Jonathan Winters. I thought that was a great ending. Um, also the prime mover. And then he also just suggested tons of stories for other episodes that I remember that are iconic. And I was like, how did I not, how did I not know about him? Because I know the other guys, other writers, I, I know the, the, that name and it's like, oh yeah, so-and-so. And so I, I, I'm glad in that way this book is out because um, I think he contributed as much as a, a lot of those other writers did. But for what, I mean, like I was as familiar with it, but it was like, I'm glad this book came out because I was I felt like I didn't really realize that. I didn't know that. I think if you can kind of educate without trying to blatantly educate, but just shine a light on somebody's contributions, that's a really great um, um, impact that you can have from a graphic novel. That's, I, I really enjoyed that part when I read it. Well, we were talking earlier uh, about uh, a, like a certain sense of inevitability that some works, they just feel like they were meant to be written. That's that's what's swirling in my head because I was thinking of Sammy Harkham and Blood of Virgin and not to equate myself with Sammy, but I, I feel like I was there at the at the right time and all of these things connected because these episodes, the four episodes that, that, that George loved the most, and, and, and he says, that that's that's me. Uh, uh, kick the can, the, the four of us are dying. Uh, Penny, for your thoughts. We can go in a little bit into the nature of uh, of how comics are turned into books because this has been many years in the making. It goes back to when I first had the kernel of an idea back in 2012. Right. And then it goes into, okay, I'm going to start the process. And then I have to find a publisher. And then lo and behold, I'm blessed with a, getting a publisher. And now I'm promoting the book. So it's it's so many years. And it, it, there's certain things that, uh, come on, you, you, you must remember nothing in the dark. But I'll blank out sometimes. because And I, I've seen this so many times. So I've, I'm just human. But uh, nothing in the dark. And then the other three, all of these are, are, are so... Uh, much a part of George. And I've had so much time to, to process this in my mind. It's all about his playing with death. Like mm -hmm. he's going he's to somehow outwit death or, or the character's going to outwit death or, or and, and, and how he dies, how he, how George actually dies. He, it's kind of like he gets to outwit death. He's going to die on Christmas day. Right. No gonna stop him. Which is right. uh, it's like, that's like a supernatural and stranger than fiction. Yeah, I remember the thing about Nothing in the Dark, and then we get tuner into Twilight Zone, is I always remember that line in the soliloquy that Rod Sterling had where he said that there was nothing in the dark that wasn't there all along. And that always stuck with me, even though I, I saw that maybe 40 years ago, maybe probably more because I've seen these episodes. And it's like, that's true. It's like we fear these things, but they're there. It's just they're scarier in the dark because it's dark, but they're really there. All these things that we worry about, and I just that, and I just thought that was just a really beautiful piece of of writing that uh, that George did. I just thought that was really that part. Of, like I said, it stuck with me for all these years, and um, I just thought that I just thought that man, you know, it's like I, I never realized it was him. <laughs> I felt bad about that. And you never know if that might have been like a, just a little extra flourish that Rod threw in, because these guys well, were com they were so uh, supportive of each other. They would, uh, it, whenever one guy needed help, say, "Hey, I'll step in." I'll, Charles Beaumont, when he had this illness that, that took over his life, the other writers come, "Hey, you don't have to credit me. I will write the rest of your script." Right. Yeah, I saw that was part of the book that really impressed me. Like it was this, this team of uh, great writers 
that were very selfless um, with their time and also taking George in um, to um, just kind of like, you know, get him like in the group and actually, you know, helping him along with his career, that mentorship kind of thing, where that's really, it's really essential. People don't realize how much of how important a good mentor is at least for a certain period of time that you need it's it's easier when someone shows you the ropes or the initial ropes so that way you're like okay now that i know this and go ahead and create because i i know this much or you have someone that can you can bounce ideas and they can tell you it's a great idea or it's a bad idea or it's a good idea but i would do this instead and that little change like makes everything click um it's it's um it's fascinating. Um, but one thing I wanted to go back before the Twilight Zone was, uh, which actually surprised me, was that he um, pitched the story for Ocean's Eleven, the 1950s um, Rat Pack vehicle um, that the remake that was done in the 90s, I think, was based off of. And and um, I'm seeing this, I'm like, I'm trying to put the connection between that movie, it's a heist film in Vegas with all these stars and than to like science fiction. But one thing of that story, and you mentioned in your book, was that when he went on the set, he found out that his name was taken off the credits. So mm -hmm. he wanted his name. So he actually approached Sinatra and told him. And then Sinatra was good enough to say, yeah, you know, we're going to get you on the credits. And actually got him on the credits because Sinatra has always struck me as a guy that if he was, if you were one of his friends, you're like a friend, like a dear friend. But if he didn't really know yeah. you, he had no time for you and it was combative. Um, my dad used to work in the hotels in Miami Beach as a waiter for 30 years. And there's a famous story. It wasn't at his hotel, but it was at the uh, Eden Rock where Sinatra called room service. And the guy who did the room service said, yeah, no problem. You got it, Frankie. Now, only Frank Sinatra's friends called him Frankie. Hmm. <laughs> that was like, that was like only a fan. So apparently he went downstairs, found the guy to the order and started punching him out. <laughs> True story. Oh my goodness. Oh. Yeah. And they were like, he's Frank Sinatra. So like people are like, what do we do? You know? And so, cause only his friends called him Frankie. So um, he was like a guy that like, he was your buddy. He was your dearest buddy. Like he wouldn't, there's nothing he wouldn't do for you. But like, if he didn't know you that well, um, he keep you at a distance. So it was like impressive that George, George Clayton Johnson just went up to him, pitched his story, and I was able to persuade him to say, yeah, yeah, you're right. You should get credit on this thing. I, I just thought that was, that was really, I thought that was really, really interesting how he could just have the guts to go with this Frank Sinatra, who is like a huge star, and just say, hey, I need you to fix a problem. I don't know. I mean, he didn't say it that way, but he came appealed to his case and he actually got satisfaction. That it conjures up a, another scene I could have put in the book where uh, I think George just naturally was a very uh, respectful, maybe in awe of Frank Sinatra. He, he didn't care for the movie, but he he certainly was respectful of Frank because on the phone, he, he, he told me, and he had the most clear blue eyes you could you could you could, you could ever imagine and so he must have spoken in a, in a way that was just naturally deferential yeah well i think well i mean he was a huge star so i mean you oh, kind yeah. of i mean i mean people in today's society it's so easy to become a star and people yeah. don't realize like in the context of being like a star like frank sinatra or you know even elvis afterwards or the beatles or even i was telling my oldest son about Mike Michael Jackson, like there's these stars that you have no idea. Like they, they couldn't exist today because anybody could be a star. But back then, like in the fifth, Frank Sinatra was such a huge star that it, it, you, you have no idea. You can't even conceive like how big they are. And so for him just to get that, I just thought that, I just thought that was an interesting story. I, I, just, oh, yeah. thought, I just thought that was really interesting. Like, wow, he, he went up to Frank Sinatra and Frank Sinatra said, you know, it's like he, he for whatever he, however he did, he, he he played his case and he got credits on it. And good for him. He had that, but he had that moxie to go up to a big star, 
politely differential, but still had that moxie to go up to Frank Sinatra. And most people be like, I can't talk to Frank Sinatra, man. He's Frank Sinatra. It's like, I can't talk to Elvis. That's Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, hey, I'm going to do it. I just thought that was an interesting insight into his character. I, I think that's, that's part of the magic of, of, of George's story. Uh, maybe some of it's is uh, body language, maybe even aura, if you want to get a new agey about it, but or, or just certain things he must have said, and that uh, a person sizes you up and goes, "Yeah, okay, I I'm gonna take a gamble. I think you're the real deal." For some reason, something strikes you about that person. I think people, we call it vibe or yeah. giving off energy. It's aura. It's just we've 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 used different words for it, but some people just have a certain way about them that you kind of feel like they're positive or they're negative or they're being sincere with you. And, you know, Frank Sinatra was no dummy. So he probably sized up a lot of people. A lot of people came to him for stuff. So he probably could size up. He's somebody that could, he's not from some local yokel from like the boonies. He, you know, he's from, I think he's from New York. I mean, you know, they could size you up and say, okay, this guy's being, this guy's being honest with me. But I mean, I didn't want to segue into that. I just thought that little piece was so fascinating knowing about Frank. I'm glad you included that. Yeah. I'm glad you included that because I thought, man, and that that I just found that made him a, a much more fascinating character. And then later on, he segues way, segues into like Alfred Hitchcock presents and all this great science fiction in Twilight Zone. And I thought, man, what a pivot! <laughs> well, I I think that uh, Ocean's Eleven is still some somehow connected uh, death defying somehow or a, a, a larger than life adventure a, a journey mm -hmm. so somehow it fits in with, with, with what he's doing and then for him to have the moxie to go up to, to frank sinatra he had to have to say moxie to go up to charles beaumont who was in a lot of ways uh, the equal of george they're, they're around the same age but charles which is such a bolt of energy and he was constantly constantly writing so maybe more he was more prodigious uh but somehow george had the balls to go up to to chuck beaumont and then to ray bradbury and so on yeah yeah because i mean ray bradbury in the 50s i mean he's on that elite tier of science fiction writers and he still won but i mean even and you know um you know, even though he's no longer with us, but it's like, yeah, you, you read that group and you think about all that talent and you're like, man, he, he hung with a pretty, pretty good crowd. Like a pretty, those guys, you know, like, there's no fakers there. All those guys can walk the walk. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, but I thought that was really interesting. And then, you yeah. know, how, and, and is, and is uh, one thing that you mentioned in the book and you show that, and there's a couple of things you refer to was um, George, Talking to Charles Borman and the other writers and always feeling like, like, like almost not that he had to prove himself, but like actually show he was as good as there or being on a, it's um, like something about like, oh yeah, you know, it's like, oh, you're getting there. Are you doing that? Or something like that. I, you know, I always thought that was kind of interesting because he seemed confident in himself, but I think he also maybe realized, okay, I'm dealing with some, like, I know my role mm -hmm. and I'm not on their level. I think I'm good, but I know I'm not on their level. So I'm going to like, kind of like keep myself honest instead of being like, Hey, you know, I can do this. It's like, I'm hanging out with Charles Beaumont. I'm hanging with Chuck Beaumont. It's like, okay, but maybe you're not quite at that level yet, even though you're hanging together, you might be as talented, but you know, I just thought that was kind of interesting. That thing or like, I wanted to show them that I could like, I could like, I deserve to be in this group. Although I think the other writers thought he deserved it. They wouldn't give him the time of day. Oh, exactly. Yeah. It's interesting because John Tomerlin was part of that group and he's really faded back. Uh, I have yet to find a, a really, really riveting John Tomerlin, but uh, there's there's so many points of investigation one could take. But I think John is probably one of those guys, among others, who, who always turned in his homework was constantly turning in their homework even if this the homework was like it's it's not going to be timeless and george was more at the, at first he was just impulsive and he was maybe he wasn't turning in his homework the way he was he was doodly supposed to and then finally 
he caught on. Right. Well, it's a learning curve. I yeah. Mean, it's, it's hard to be good and then it's harder to be consistently good. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's consistency is the hard part where like you, you, you see like, um, you see, yeah, it's like, okay, there's another good script or it's another good script. Or sometimes you'll see like a TV series and it's like, oh, it's written by so-and-so and you're like, oh, okay, this is going to be a good episode because so-and-so is writing it or, um, you know, without even knowing what the episode's about, but you're like, you've seen enough work of that other person being consistently good that you're like, and it happens like in comic books too. Like there's certain people that like Dan Klaus just announced his new book and it's like, I'm buying it. And everybody I know is like, oh yeah, we're buying it. Yeah. We're going to buy it because mm -hmm. you, you know that at its worst, it's going to be very good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just thought it's, that's just the thing about being consistently good. But I, I thought that that time in Twilight Zone was really interesting. Um, and, you know, and, and just doing all the other writing. So, yeah, there's that thing about volume and there's that other thing about volume versus being really good. And when you hit it, when you come in, you really nail it. I think eventually he was able to do it a lot more, but you're right. But I think his early stuff was good and they realized, OK, he's, he, this guy's definitely got the goods. Oh, I think he, he always had the, had the goods, but I would. With Twilight Zone, you're you're hitting for the stars, and so right. you, you wanted to take it to a higher level. Well, I think he did. I mean, you yeah. look at some of these episodes, even the ones that he just gave the story about, but he didn't do the teleplay. They're still great stories. I, I I meant to write them down, but I mean, if you look at the ones, you do a quick Google search and you see the ones that he says story by story by, you're like, oh, like these are really good stories. It's like, wow, you're you're like. I remember this episode. I remember this episode. So that was something that I loved. Like I said, I loved about the book that I was able to like kind of rediscover like this part of Twilight Zone that I didn't realize was there and some other science fiction that I didn't know was there. And it's like, oh, this guy's been hiding in plain sight. And and so I, I think that is one of the benefits of this book. What's interesting to me is that people who know him are go. Oh, George Clayton Johnson, you're doing a book on him. The, the people who know him really love him. So I mean, I, that's what I I came across uh, when I was in the. That's what it was such a a matter of, of perfect timing because I I don't normally go to Comic Con as just a given, but I, I went that particular year, and then uh, I went to see George uh, a few years later. And I had a conversation with with, with another enter entertainment person who immediately was like, oh, George Clayton Johnson. And uh, it just went on and on. I, I was at the Hollywood Museum and the person working the front desk, she her eyes uh, lit up when I mentioned George, but and she had a, a big connection to George. So I just kept coming across that. Yeah, I think like if people are in a certain genre, they know who's good, despite whether or not they have as much "quote unquote" press or casual knowledge. But I think the people that really know, really know. Like um, there are certain people that I know. They'll say, "I'll say, hey, are you familiar with this cartoonist?" And like, I never read them. It's like, oh yeah, they're really good. Or you mention somebody, and they're like, oh yeah, I know that person. And it's like, oh, yeah. and you realize, oh, you. There's other people that know about this person like sometimes i'll mention something and they'll like someone um especially some of these like newer indie guys that are like really amazing it's it's like oh yeah yeah they're great or sometimes i'll find out about somebody and they say hey you gotta check this guy out and you're like huh and then when you mention them like oh yeah i love his work so i think the people that really know really know and the people that like quality especially like they're i love their stuff that's the people that know you find that audience and that audience is like the ones that are going to really dig this novel. Um, but I just think it's a fascinating story because just to backtrack a little bit, um, he was grew up in, I, was it Wyoming? Yeah. Uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Cheyenne, Wyoming. And um, he quit school. Like yeah, when he was grade. 15 or in eighth grade, he quit school, started doing some jobs. And then, um, he I was literally he, out on the streets for, yeah, for a, a short period, and then they joined the army later. He joined joined the army, and you know, got out of there, and did, with the GI Bill, was able to finance, um, I think, his um, this degree, his college education. But I just thought, I I kind of like was like, 
that to me is like a fascinating story in itself. Oh, uh, I mean, like, okay, you, you quit in the eighth grade, you're in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I mean, I'm not, not Cheyenne, but I mean, it's not like New York City or Boston or LA where there's all these things going on. I mean, a lot of wide open spaces. This is back in the um, 40s, I think. This is back in the 40s well, that yeah. happened. He was born at the, at the start of the Great Depression, so that's right. Okay, so maybe yeah, maybe okay, fifth forty nine fifty, and it's like that was really like wide open spaces. It's not like today where it doesn't matter where you are; you have an internet connection and you have all this technology. Um, it, I just thought that was really fascinating that he just was like, yeah, this is not working for me. And then he was out on the streets for whatever reason, and then somehow he made it as a writer. Cheyenne, Wyoming today would be very uh, attractive to, to a lot of people, but it, it's a different world we live in now. Well, yeah, I, it would be attractive to a lot of people. It's not a knocking, but I'm just saying as far as oh, of access, course. access to like... Absolutely. Uh, so because back then, people don't people that weren't alive in a pre-internet era just have no idea how all this, all this media and all this science fiction, all this writing came out of like major cities for the most part and then filter down to the rest of the country at various paces. Well, I, I think for people of his generation, uh, it, it was just uh, the magic of, of seeing uh, these larger than life things on, on the movie screen, uh, Frankenstein, for instance. Yes. And then the larger than life uh, stimulation from, from reading, from reading The Wizard of Oz, for instance. Or the mm -hmm. Frankenstein the novel, so those go hand in hand. Frankenstein the novel and the movie, they're just like a, a constant in, in uh, George's life. That's so significant to him. Maybe it's different because I think back then you actually had to read science fiction, and reading is what really opens the mind because no one's showing you. I mean, you have the movies like Frankenstein and stuff, but I think you had to read a lot of science fiction, and everybody interprets it differently or how they see it. I think. Um, back then, I mean, Frankenstein is still a classic film. I mean, if you ever see like the, I mean, if you're the first Frankenstein, um, and then you see the part where they edit out that you, you always edit out where he actually drowns the girl and you <laughs> realize, oh, he really is a monster. I mean, despite being an un, un, misunderstood monster, he's still a monster. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I just think that, um, that was just, you know, it, it, that's a class. It's still a great film. It's shot well. It's acted well. Even the the sequel, The Bride of Frankenstein, that further developed the character. Made him a little bit more sympathetic. You know, toned down the monster, but he was still a monster as heart. He was just trying to find love. But I thought the first Frankenstein was just a great film. But I think back then, when you had to, I think when you had to read a lot more or you could read the source material, I think that was better because I think that sparks the imagination. When you see the movie, sometimes you can get influenced by seeing a movie, but I mm -hmm. think it influences like maybe visually or how you want to do certain things. Um, I think it's hard to pick up. This is me. I think it's hard sometimes to pick up on story unless the story is really good. Um, but I think the reading part is still the essential part. That's where like you get all these ideas and it gets, gets your brain cooking. Oh, God, yes. Well, I highly recommend somebody read Frankenstein. I think once you start reading it, you can't put it down. Uh, but that's Mary Shelley's amazing writing. Yes. Bram Stoker's yes. Dracula is a little bit more of a slog, but it's still, it's, still, it's still riveting, but it's not comparable, really, I think, to Frankenstein. Yeah, it's just um, and it's amazing that these books are so, been around for so long, and they're still... They're still good. They're still touching all these themes and these human interactions that are believable. Yeah, I think that timeless quality, that's like the mark of any great any great fiction. Like, okay, this is 100 years old, <laughs> but it's still pretty good, especially in today's days where everything, the rate of change happens so quickly that it's easier to fall into irrelevancy, but it's still good. I think that really stands... Uh, a testament. I, I don't know. This is my opinion, but um, no. oh, that's what uh, all of these writers could share. Ha they had in, in common. They they had read all, all of these books and more. Uh, uh, they were all well, well read. 
mm -hmm. Charles Beaumont could Im immediately pick up the George was they were on the same page. And uh, the thing they had on George was that most of them, if not all of them, had already been writing for for the pulps for a while. Mm -hmm. And and I don't I don't I don't believe George had any. He might have because there's there's little bits and pieces that uh, we'll never we'll never know for sure. But I don't think he'd written for the pulps. I don't think he had any pulp fiction credits. But all the other guys did for sure. Okay. Yeah. So that yeah, it, it's that. It's like that saying, like it took me 20 years to become an overnight success. Yes. <laughs> you have to do the work. Um, maybe nobody, maybe, yeah, I mean, you have to work at the craft. So, and that, and back then they had to crank out those stories and a lot of stories. Um, it's sort of like, um, there's that book called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. That's the book that the, that 10,000 hour rule came. And they talked about the Beatles were a subject and they talked about before the Beatles came out with their first album, um, by a weird confluence of events, they were hired by this German strip club owner because he needed a band. So they did these contracts for three or four months to play seven days a week, eight hours a day in these strip clubs. So they said that the Beatles had to learn songs really fast. They had to learn how to write songs. They played a lot together. Um, and then they would, they, they played and they played, they did all this work and then they came back for a second tour and they got better. And then by the time they came back from the third tour, the people would stop going to the strip club to see the main attraction and started going there to see the Beatles. <laughs> That's how good they got. So when their first album came out um, and it was a smash hit, it was like, okay, these guys just didn't come off the street. They've been playing eight hours a day, seven days a week, four months at a go. Um, and they did that, you know, like three times. So you compute the hours they did as like thousands and thousands of hours just working on your craft. So by the time they were recorded, it's like they were just, they were already pros. It's just that nobody had heard of them. And yeah, so I think, and that's what I think is sort of that, like these guys did the pulps, so they did the work. Oh yeah, they just made them much, much better writers because they'd done it for so long. Right. Yeah, I, I found that part interesting. And then um, uh, and, and then more about him that I felt interesting was that he co-wrote Logan's Run, which I, I saw the movie um, when I was younger. I, you know, and I, I didn't, I haven't read the book. I'm sure the book is better. Oh, good luck. Yeah, but I always thought that concept of, and again, I guess that theme that you had mentioned when we talked earlier about death or define death because if people aren't familiar, you should you should read the read the book. I don't read the book, but the movie's fascinating. Basically, the premise is you have a world in the future. There's no death. There's no disease. I mean, there's no disease. There's no financial hardships. You can live a very hedonistic lifestyle. Everybody looks good. Everybody's thin. Everybody's healthy. The only deal is that when you turn thirty, you go into this ceremony and you. Um, cease to exist and you're supposed to come back as another person later on so at 30 you hit it and then there's this group of people that try to escape the city before they because they're going to turn 30 and then there's these people that chase after them they're trackers and logan is one of the trackers and so um this this whole world and i thought that was just a really so i still think it's a fascinating premise where like hey we're going to take care of everything for you your life is going to be great and then at 30 you say okay i had a great run by and i just thought that was like the price you would pay i would say uh, one interesting thing you'll pick up on when you read the novel is that and this was george's idea that uh, you don't die at 30 you die at 18. oh so he, he like really uh, takes it to another level and he says, imagine that the president of the United States, a teenager, imagine the energy, <laughs> the urgency. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and, and uh, that's another thing, like, I, I'm in my late 50s and I tell people, I don't want anybody really older than I am running, being president. I think everybody should be younger than me. I think some, you, should, you need somebody that's like in their 40s. I, 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 I know there's sometimes a correlation between being older and being wiser, but I think you need somebody with energy to lead. Um, I, I think, I mean, that's one of my funny, I always say that, I say, no, I don't want anybody older than me being president. 
No. Because usually people that are older want somebody old because, you know, if you're old, you've been around, you know everything. It's like, no, sometimes you need somebody young to come in with ideas and say, no, we're going to do something different. Not, I know you did it this way for the last five administrations, but no, mm -hmm. I, I don't think so. I mean, Kennedy, I mean, Kennedy's time as president, there were some flaws. But one of the things that he brought in was um, we're not going to just do all these things the way that the other guys did because they did them. Like a lot of times dealing with his generals, his generals didn't like him because all the other guys were either former generals or they were guys that were like, well, you're you're the military expert. What do you think we should do? And they kind of gave him carte blanche. And Kennedy, serving, having served as a PT boat commander, knew that there's a difference between what was going on, on the ground and what the generals thought was going on. So he was always distrustful of like the top brass because he knew that mm -hmm. reality was different. And I think an older person would sit there and say, well, you know, I'm going to talk to the experts. And then a younger person would be like, yeah, I, I'm not feeling that. I think we're going to do something different. I'm going to, I, I appreciate your opinion, but I think we're going to over, I'm going to overrule you because I'm the president and I can. And I think a younger person is more kind. And just, just a side way, but I think I like that 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 talking about that urgency yeah i agree can you imagine if you're like a 16 year old president and you only got two more years to go you're gonna try to get every, you're gonna try to keep everything great <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know? I, I love your your stream of consciousness there <laughs> sorry <laughs> i can edit it out if you want later um no it it, it works yeah actually I, I i brought up the uh the candy assassination with george once mm -hmm. and uh his observation was very brief, but but interesting. He said, "Yeah, bef before that, everyone was more buttoned down." <laughs> that just stayed with me. That's that's what I remember. And and uh, how true, how true. I, I I liked. I remember with Logan's run. I um. I, I just thought that the whole concept, and then how he has to track and then he becomes one of these people. So you have to wonder, well, is the state being really honest with you or not? And that whole thing of questioning the state, like you realize, oh, maybe the state isn't really up and up on everything. I thought that's a, that's an analogy you could do in the seventies or in the sixties um, because people were starting to challenge this, publicly challenge this notion of like, well, maybe the state doesn't have all the right answers. Um, I, 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 and I always liked that, era of science fiction because um as we mentioned earlier it held a mirror up to like society but it also challenged a lot of um preconceived notions from older generations and you realize well maybe you know you're not really getting the real story here your style is fluid it's not like um greco uh, you know like like it's not like you know greco roman god like perfection all it doesn't have to be I don't, I don't care i liked it but i was just kind of curious about your art styles like and your inf your influences i mean i don't want to ask the can question but i was really kind of curious because um i always have to know what creators are influenced by and what they read and what they like because i usually think oh that's what i should be reading too well this is something uh that uh involves somebody who was cooking his style for many, many years and, and so many layers. I, it's hard to keep track of all of them, but I did a comic strip when I was in college for many years. And one person commented, that, you know, that kind of reminds me of Gasoline Alley. And I don't know that they meant it as a compliment. Today it would be considered a compliment, but I, I just love uh, the more naturalistic, semi-realistic, uh, slice of life, gumbo, a quirky style. And then later, after college, I got more into the alternative comic scene. Uh -huh. And uh, a lot of it was uh, my uh, relationship with Jennifer Daydreamer. We've been together as a couple for many, many years. And she introduced, oh, wonderful. She introduced me to a lot of stuff. She's a published cartoonist. You can find her under Top Shelf Productions. And anyway, I, I've always been an inquisitive little devil. And so I, I've tried to, once I, I, I point it in the right direction, I'll, I'll zero in and try to learn as much as I can. I, I'm only human. I don't know everything, of course. And Nobody I'll have, does. Yeah. Well, people will mention a cartoonist. I go, well, yeah, I've heard of him, but I actually, or her, I haven't read their work or whatever. But uh, 
I think it, it was kind of a, just a style that worked for me. <clears throat> I think of Sammy Harkin right now, because he just happens to be on the front burner. You, you want to create a style that's workable. Uh, it's cartoony. It's uh, easy to uh, work with. I think that's what I fell into. Okay. Um, I had mentioned that I was reading these drawn and quarterly collections, these coffee table books. They were published mm -hmm. 20 years ago. Two of them had the Sunday strips reprinted, like 30 of them each. So I was able to read, and I know that the Sunday strips are sort of like his day to experiment and go off on these, do these dream adventures, and they weren't part of the daily narrative. It was like Dick Tracy, which the, the, a Sunday continued the Saturday story and it led into Monday. But I, I, I mean, I would take that as a compliment because you look at some of that stuff, you look at some of that and you're like, man, this guy in the 40s and the 30s and 40s was ahead of his time. Some of the stuff he's playing around with, with um, layout and uh, timing and humor, you're like, wow, this is like way ahead of his time. I would take that as a compliment. Um, you know, um, and I think uh, the style, I mean, cartoony works. If it, if it works for the story, then, then it works. I mean, like, no Mask Guy was my favorite cartoonist. That's cartoony. Who Who is? No, no Mask Guy. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, that's cartoony, and he's my favorite yeah. cartoonist. I mean, because yeah. it's, it's, it fits it fits what he's doing. Um, and so I think that, no, that's cool, because I, I looked at it, and I'm like, I can't really peg this. Um, and, and so, and usually, I mean, I'm not an expert, just trust me, there's a lot of artists that people tell me, oh, you're like, just like you, it's like, oh, oh, have you ever read this stuff? It's like, yeah, I heard the name, but I've never read them. And people are like, you've never read them? It's like, no. And so I'm um, like, now I'm reading this, like I'm reading the Sandman by Neil Gaiman now. And people are like, you never read that? I'm like, no, not, no, I'm getting to it. <laughs> just too many comics. But I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, as far as your style, I just wanted to get an idea. I couldn't peg it to anything. I, I think that was deliberate because I, I, like I was telling you off camera, I've been, a, I'm a person who always wants to get all the ducks in a row. So I was looking for something that wasn't uh, uh, aping off somebody else necessarily. Of Good. course, of course, you're always borrowing from other people, but I wanted to try to, which is a very difficult thing to do, create your own style or your own take on on a time-honored comics tradition. Yeah, I, I, I liked it. I also liked, I, I don't know the, in, the intent, but I liked how sometimes it wasn't, it was linear, but sometimes non-linear because you start off and you start talking about him and then being in the writer's room and being getting in the group. And then you kind of flash back to the experiences with his wife before he even got involved with Twilight Zone. And then you kind of like fast forward, but it worked. And I thought with the art, because the art is cartoony, but there's also like this kind of like, um, I don't know about dreamlike quality, but there's this sort of quality where there's enough realism to be real, but it's not like hyper real. And I thought that kind of fit. It, was, it wasn't like trippy or anything like that, but I just thought it had this kind of like interesting flow to itself when I, when I read it. I thought, okay, oh, we're going back in time. Okay, we're doing the flow. Okay. Okay, now we're here. It's like okay, so this fits in like his wife being support or his, his wife being supportive of him early on. It's like okay, now it leads into like it, it kind of explains some of the backstory and then it leads into this. I thought that was an interesting choice. Uh, I thought it was. I thought I liked it. I thought that was kind of. Uh, um, I thought that was kind of interesting. I, I think it felt it, it fit the whole vibe of the book. Well, thank you for for saying that. It makes me feel really good. Yeah, I mean, I I, I told you I read it. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I can't opine on it or have any comment or talk to you about it. If I don't, I'm not going to skim through it. I'm going to actually read it. Um, and in your case, I read it twice because there was a lot there. There's a lot that I wasn't familiar with um, about George Clayton Johnson. So it's like I actually had to go back and do some research and realize how little I knew about him. And then I could like read the book with a different set of eyes because I was more familiar I was like, oh, there's, there's a lot of stuff about this guy I never knew about. Let me check it out. I was like, okay, now I'm better informed about him. Let me read the book again. And then I was able to, like, 
enjoy it, but I was able to like see it a little differently and then pick up on something. Because sometimes you read a book and you pick up on something and you read it again, you're like, oh, I didn't pick up on this or I didn't notice that he did this or there's little things that are done on purpose, but you don't pick up on them. Maybe subliminally you pick up on them in the back of your brain, but you don't pick up on them until you actually like think about them. So I, I thought that was, um, that was kind of cool. Had a kind of cool, I think it kind of almost like would fit. I can see why George would approve because it seemed like that would be the kind of thing that he was open to. Yeah, I, I, that was always going on in my mind. I'm going to honor George. I'm going to meet uh, his wishes from, from what I gleaned from uh, all our conversations. What would George want? How is this going to honor him and what he wants to see uh, expressed in the book? Yeah, um, also one thing in the book that you wrote about making the graphic novel is that you referred that the book was um, that 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 George was elusive, but he seemed to like take you in. So uh, I, I guess I, I didn't want to like presuppose what I meant by elusive was. I mean, other than you really had to like over time you develop the relationship but it seemed like oh but he was always elusive like because there's certain points where he's talking about something and that's it he doesn't talk about it anymore and then you essentially exactly. he could be elusive times and it was like i guess i guess i want a little bit more insight into that because i thought that was interesting because you kind of prevent the way i read it was like he was talking about something it was like but then he'd be elusive about something else so you always had to like seem like you were like i don't know if it's your experience maybe it's just me interpreting it wrong but like you were just trying to like pull um or just get information from him, kind of glean these things together. Well, that's why it helps to actually be as close as you can to being in the room when it happened. Uh, I actually spending real face time with him in his own home. Yeah. Uh, because I think there was always ingrained in him, uh, you got to earn it, man. I'm not going to just give it away. You're going to have to show me, show me a little more. Keep proving yourself to me. And, so there were certain things that maybe uh, he didn't necessarily want to go into. He, he didn't necessarily, and, and that one co conversation I had with him, asking him, what can you tell me about uh, the writers you worked with? And then I, I said, uh, like John Tomerlin, and he was probably thinking, that, that question is too vague. You got to earn it, baby. And I want, I actually, my I, what I should have been fixating on right then was Char Charles Beaumont. And so I was hoping to come back the next time and talk yeah. to him about it. But th by then it was too late, he was already in hospice. So I missed my chance, but I got a, I got a lot of stuff and he gave me a lot of stuff. It, it's up, it was up to me to research it further. He was okay. he kept pointing in the right directions. He said, look, over here, Theodore Sturgeon, this is important to you. Mm -hmm. You story. mentioned that in the book. Look right, over mentioned. here, um, go back and ask William F. Nolan about Max Brand and, and what he was doing. Okay, so he was making, yeah, he was making you earn it. Yeah, because a lot of these guys, a lot, I think a lot of times people that when somebody wants to do a, uh, a story about them, they're like, oh, I'll tell you everything because you know they want like their story, their record, and he's being a rebel is like <laughs> pointing in the right directions as you as directions as you said, or I'm um, giving you little pieces, but hey, I give you something, but you're gonna have to figure the rest of it out, and then when you come back to me and show that you've actually done this, I'll give you a little more. Like I'll just give you a little more, like, like raising the bar each time, um, yeah. which is to me is fascinating. And I think that kind of keeps you engaged. And so just telling you the story, you're like, oh man, it's like a detective story. It's like, you got to <laughs> hunt all this information. And back then, even though you had the internet, it, it, getting it from, it, it's still easier now than maybe 10, 15 years ago. You had to really do a lot of work. Well, the biggest secret is reading. So I would go back and read all of these novels that uh, that he'd suggest. Uh, uh, oh God, who is the? Uh, I'd have to look it up. Because I, I asked him, well, what's an example of a good humorous writer? And he pointed me in the right direction, and I read him. And I read all all the writers that were part of the group. I read some of their stuff, one way or another. Right, and some of the the work fell short in some cases, or I, I couldn't find a really great example. But uh, others, uh, just fascinating stuff. Like, oh my God, uh, Ray Russell, the case against Satan. 
you have to read that because it is super spooky. Yeah, you mentioned that. You mentioned that in the book as well because I okay. like that. I, I like to the bring fact it up that, again. No, but I like the fact that you like are also mentioning books to read. Yeah, like, because no, because like in uh, I don't know if you read it as a cartoonist by Noah Van Skyver. Yeah, but at the end he does that. These are some books that helped me along the way, and there's like 65 graphic yeah. novels, and I've I felt I felt ashamed that I only read five of them, but the five of them <laughs> that I've read were all amazing, and you see some of the names. So I like that the book has that bit of that quality where it's like, okay, I'm going to tell you the story, but I'm also going to tell you that maybe you ought to read these books, not only nope. if you want insight, but just because they're so good that you want to read them kind of like you're, you're giving a story, but you're also telling people to um, learn more on your own. I, I, I kind of like that. Well, I've tried to make the book uh, internet proof where it's chock full of Easter eggs. Like you, you could stand at my table at a, at a comics convention and read some of it, but you can't read all of it. You, you can't take it all home without actually just go ahead and buy it and you're going to love it. So just, it's that kind of book. It's just so many Easter eggs in there. Yeah. And the thing is, I don't know enough to know. Like, I, like sometimes you can tell there's something in here, but you don't know enough to know what to look for. And then later on, when you learn a little bit, it, it, like, oh, I see what he was trying to do here. But you kind of have to like, no, it's sort of like uh, with the Easter eggs, like you can kind of like take it on its own but then when you know the you know a lot of the detail and things that go behind it you're like oh i see what they were doing or i can see where they got they did a little homage or shout out what they call it to this thing or this is wherever but you have to know enough to know mm -hmm. like you don't you don't you don't know what you don't know and then you're like <laughs> oh and then you'll learn but that keeps it interesting because then you're like it's that one of the things that i like about switching to indie comics is that I always feel like I'm learning something or I'm seeing something new or I'm seeing somebody's different take. I, I read a lot of different stuff. I, I don't have like, I like this type of comic. I, I like different types of art. I like different types of story. And I think by you telling these things where like, this is Easter egg or you should really read this or this is book is that he pointed me to. It's like, you're kind of saying, you know, George, George pointed me to this book and now I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna point you to this book. You should really read. And so I, I thought that was kind of a cool sub piece where you didn't do it very obviously, but the second reading I kind of picked up on, oh, okay, he's, 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 he's kind of nudging us, like George nudged them, he's nudging us to do the same. I thought that was, I don't, I don't know if that was intentional or subliminal, but I thought that was a, that was a nice piece to do. It was a combination of things because uh, I went over this book so many different times with so many re revisions and uh, testing it material out like a stand-up comic, because I did a I did one version of it as a mini comic, and I just tried to tried to material out it at a comics convention. And the one thing that uh, stayed stayed with me was this uh, one person who kind of dared me. It was just I oh it was so irritating. He said, "Well, I." I never watched any Twilight Zone episodes. Like, okay, well, maybe you should. I, I don't know. What am I saying? I, that's, I can't help you. I, and so I thought, well, what did he mean by that? What, what was he, was it something that he didn't care about? Or So I, that stayed with me. I just said, I took it very hard. And I, I'm going to put in this book a way to explain what is it about the Twilight Zone that's significant? What is it about it that's special? Why should you care? I think that there's a lot of, um, I think that when it comes to some of this older science fiction, older TV programs, is that people kind of, younger generations have grown up on a certain type of TV presentation, whether or not it be dramas, whether or not it be um, animation. And, you know, when you see a Twilight Zone episode, that is almost all, it's all black and white, it's all dialogue, it's all acting, it's music. It's like the core things you need to do like to make a good film. I think a lot of people just don't get that part until they know enough to know. Mm, yeah. It, it's sort of like whenever they do a new Star Trek episode series, they always get these writers and they say, you know, we're gonna do something fresh 
and different and we're gonna you know we're gonna make it for the 21st century we're gonna make it for this decade and then whatever usually the first season flops because they don't know the material well enough to capture the spirit of it and they don't get the fans and the fans even though they're like in their 20s they've seen all those old star trek episodes from you know with william shatner they know all those episodes and they know the continuity they know the history they know what things are supposed to look like they know the timeline so when they come up with something fresh and hip it's like that's not going to work because you lost the fans and i think that sometimes you have a lot of younger creators that look at that stuff and say, oh, you know, it's just acting. It's all in black and white. It's not even in color. How good could it be? And mm -hmm. they don't know enough to know. And then later on, we have to see Star Trek episodes. They go back and they start paying homage and actually getting in with the continuity and stuff. And then the series will get better because they realize that they didn't, they just thought they could just like change everything. And then they didn't realize that. And I think that happens a lot where these guys are like, oh, I don't read this stuff. Oh, that's not black and white. I, don't, I never watch Outer Limits. It's like, well, maybe you should because some of those writers were also, I mean, with, you know, George didn't write for Outer Limits, but it's like, so another series, like, you know, maybe you should because there's some people that wrote for that series, that show that, you know, are great science fiction writers. So I, I think there's, I think the people that are like real fans read it, but I think that sometimes people kind of like think they know, but they don't know enough to know like how important pivotal, pivotal that work is. That's just, my my thing i'm sorry you had that experience but i mean you can't make everybody happy no you can't but there's there's two points a part of the what you need need to know is you don't have to know anything because i'm going to explain it right go go over it and uh it's a, it's a, a story about storytelling too so mm -hmm. even if you don't necessarily think you're a fan of the the subject matter no i think no i i meant i meant about like the TV show, I think. Yeah. Because your book, again, I'm familiar with the shows that he wrote on. I remember a lot of those episodes, but I wasn't familiar with George Clayton Johnson. I wasn't familiar with him. It wasn't to me a name that popped up, but I found it interesting. Um, the more I read, the more I got into him, I was like, this is a fascinating story. And I thought it's, a, it's an interesting story. And I thought, um, yeah, you don't need to know anything because I came into it blank. It's not like, oh, I know who he is. I'm like, I felt kind of ashamed that I didn't know who he was after I read the book because I should have known because I'm a fan of the material that he wrote. I just didn't realize it was him because I think, you know, you, you, you think twice as anything, Rod Sterling. But it, it, even though I, he didn't write all the episodes and he never said he did, he, uh, it, it, so I think, yeah, you don't need to come in with anything for this book. But if you're a fan of like, that era of science fiction you definitely are going to enjoy this because you see somebody that was like in that early period when all this great stuff was being made and like you said i think in a lot of ways you wrote it it's like being there it's like george is almost like george is telling you this story mm -hmm. through, you, through, through you but he's really telling you this story and you're presenting it the way that he would like if he was like almost like he was like telling you a story but you did it in a graphic novel format. Well, the other thing I want to mention is that it's hard to pin down what exactly the Twilight Zone is. Uh, I, I think there was a problem with the, the latest uh, version of the Twilight Zone because it, it didn't quite capture everything the Twilight Zone was about. Uh, part of it is, oh yeah, it, there's stories with a twist ending like, oh, Henry, but that's not everything. No. It's more like the John Collier stories. That's going a little deeper. It's uh, going in, into a, a person is getting their comeuppance. It, it's going into well, uh, a veiled uh, social commentary, of course. But then there's there's the ex extra extra something. Uh, the touch of strange is is a thing that George hit on over mm -hmm. and over. It's a touch of strange. It's almost you almost can't put your, you can't, it's almost like you can't describe it. It's almost like beyond words. It's a touch of strange. Yeah, I think the thing is those episodes were very well written and they were telling a story about people. And I, I think you're right. They, it's like the M. Night Shyamalan movies. they always have that twist ending, but sometimes it's like the story really isn't that great. And then you have the twist ending, but it's, it's again, like, like, um, 
uh, like uh, like a, the, the sixth sense when you see you're like oh, okay i get that or even um the um uh, i have the dvd by blank on the title of the movie the, the one he did with bruce willis where bruce willis is a superhero um unbreakable and um and you, you and then you re and then you have that twist ending um but i think those movies built up a story and then like you said then they had the twist ending um, I think a lot of times they just think, oh, that's the hook. So we got to make sure we have the hook. But you got to like, you got to have the meat in the sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> to use a very simple term. And there's like, okay, you lose this really nice bread and it's toasted and you have this balsamic glaze. But like, where's the meat? Where's like the stuff that you want to have in there? And so I, I think that's the problem with a lot of, again, I think it's a lot of this Oh well, you know we we know what's the story, but they're not really fans of the product. Like, you have to be a fan of the thing that you're rebooting or you're doing or you're paying homage to, because then you understand it, and then you can kind of do it justice. And one other wrinkle is that uh, we're only human, and this was a show on network television, and it had deadlines to meet. So, not every episode is a gem. And Rod Sterling was painfully aware of that there, there were some clunkers, so that that makes it a little more confusing, maybe. But it's just it is what it is. It, it, it's the nature of network television show after episode after episode. So some of the episodes are dated, but the ones that are not, the ones that test it, stand the test of time are yes, totally total yeah. Gem. Well, remember back then they were doing like twenty between twenty five and thirty thirty one episodes. Uh, a season yeah, yeah and and like like breaking bad is an excellent television show but how many episodes did you have in a season exactly 10, ten? <laughs> so you know it's easy to write 10 really good episodes i mean it's not easy but it's easier than writing 20 or 21 or 20 or 30 like i saw the first season that had 30 i think 30 or 32 episodes i was like wow i was like i was just stunned that they could they actually called that many episodes now you now you these great shows like you know, like i said breaking bad or better call saw which i also love 10 episode seasons that's it you get 10 episodes and you gotta wait a year year and a half and then you have a year year and a half to like work on 10 episodes and, and i mean back then you're right they were just cranking these out they had deadlines they had sponsors um that they had to make happy i, I think there's one episode uh, judgment. I think it's Judgment Night, the one with Nehemiah Persoff, where he awakens. He's a U-boat commander, and he awakens on a, on a on a on a British convoy ship that's lost. And there's a scene where he's in the bar, and the first officer comes in, and he goes, he asks the guy, "Oh, a tray for the captain." And it was apparently I read it was in the liner notes of this collection that my brother had, and it was like apparently in the script he said, a "Tea for the captain." Because he's British and British drink tea, but one of the sponsors was the coffee coffee company, and like no, it's got to be coffee. And mm -hmm. it's like, but the British didn't drink coffee; they drank tea. So the way they got around with it, say, okay, a tray for the captain. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the story. I read that, and I was like, oh yeah. I mean, I'm amazed that these guys could just do so much, and even if there were some clunkers, overall um the body of work is amazing i mean you know from george clayton johnson the stories he had because a lot of the things he didn't read the teleplay he just wrote the story when you read the story you're like oh wow he wrote that story it's like he came up with that idea it's like just amazing some of the, a lot of the stuff that he did so again that's why I, I liked a lot about the book it's like it's like somebody that was there all along that i did i personally didn't know about and so mm -hmm. i'm sure that somebody that knows about him is going to say yes all right <laughs> so he got his due <laughs> because I just thought it was, I mean, I'm familiar with the material, but I wasn't familiar with him. Um, but yeah, I thought it was very accessible. Um, gave you enough. You know, if you want to know more, you can go on your own. But I mean, it gave you enough to tell a story. I thought it was a pretty cool vibe as far as, it seemed like I said, it, it seemed like if George was writing a comic book or was telling you the story, it was like almost like you were like telling him, George is like through with your own interpretations, of course, but in your own artistic license and your own style. But it seemed like it was like 
like you're reading like somebody was telling you this story. Like I was there and this is what happened and I was, and this is what I, this is my experiences. But again, there's this little bit of like touches, like you're not going to get the full, you're not going to get everything. You're not going to get the whole biography. You're just going to get enough to know and then you can put it together if you want or not, but that's up to you. Yeah. I, I, you notice we haven't even touched on cannabis. Oh Which, God. Yeah. There's yeah. so much in this book. I'm telling you guys that. Yeah. Yeah, there is. He was a real early, he was an early um, a promoter and a spokesperson for legalization of cannabis um, back in an era where, um, you know, cause even though cannabis today is still a class one drug and I don't know how you equate it to heroin, they're, they're two different drugs. Um, he was an early proponent of legalization and only now are you starting to see it and it's still nationwide is not legalized, which is, it's, it puts the cannabis stores in a real difficult situation because it's still hard for them to get, um, you know, now it's easier, but the first, it's a hard time to get bank accounts. A lot of them can't, couldn't get credit cards because the credit card supplier, because they're like, oh, well, it's a class one drug. I don't want to have a problem. Um, I, I don't want to have a problem with the federal government. Um, and so, it, 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 that was really interesting um, that he was a proponent of that. Um, yeah, I mean, we didn't even talk about that. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, but the, I actually, it, uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I actually went uh, off into a, a journey to uh, discover cannabis in, de in, in depth. And since I was in Seattle, I got to see the, uh, the rise of the cannabis industry. And I interviewed uh, somebody who was running a, a, one of the leading cannabis stores. And she said she, that was the main problem that is that you can't operate like a normal business uh, with, with a bank account. And so you, that was a constant concern. Yeah. Frustration. There's a book by a cartoonist named Box Brown where he talks yes, about, yeah. ca about cannabis. And you read that and I'm like, Oh, cannabis is part of the Hindu god mythology from like 5,000 years ago. And it's like, oh, and you're like, that puts it in perspective. And then how it was like, you know, that whole thing about, um, and, and I still don't get this whole, it's a class one drug. I, I just don't see it because you see people who are, these, all these people that have had opioid addictions um, and the, and yeah. the destructive, destructiveness it's had on society those are based on a class one drug. It's called the poppy plant. You don't see that with cannabis. You don't see people, you don't see that with cannabis. I mean, I, I know people that are like general counsels for, I, I met someone that was general counsel for a company and that guy, you know, he smoked cannabis and he was good at his job, you know? So, but you know, they, they, there's still this, it's less and less, especially with the younger generation. Like we went on a trip to California and, 20 and 2019 and i was like getting stressed out about something and my and my son who was like 17 or 18 time goes to me dad maybe you need to go in one that canada store there <laughs> <laughs> and i said no your mom would kill me <laughs> but 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 i was thinking i said no your mom would kill me but i was thinking yeah he's right i probably would but i could um you know yeah, I, I live I, I live in florida here and it's still like it's, it's you can get it and and you can get it medically approved at least in Dade County, Miami Dade County, where I live in. But it's still not like you can just go to the, the store and 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 just buy some because you want some, um, you know, or have guys people walk you through and say, okay, well, this blend does this. What kind of high are you looking for? Which is which is a way. I mean, it's like because you know, it's like different strains affect people differently. It's like, what kind of high yeah. are you looking for? Uh, what do you want? Okay, this one does this. This one does that. Um, you know, you can edibles, but be careful with the edibles because it can be really powerful. You know, this stuff you need somebody. And it's not like okay, we're just gonna sell you weed in the back of a trunk, and you know, you don't know if it's like real weed. You don't know if they mixed it with like some weird chemical or something. It's it's a legit business because you know. Um, Let's just say back in the day when you didn't have this back in my young days, sometimes you got stuff and you're like, oh, man, I don't know what they put in this thing, man. But this thing, is, I got a headache. It's like you don't have that hair. It's better when it's, you know, legal and it's re regulated. And, you know, you have people that really care about the product. They're trying to explain the product to you. 
And so I'm glad that George was like, really, it's just kind of interesting that he was way ahead of the, of the times with that. Yeah, it, it, they take that very seriously. At, well, at least from the Seattle scene, and they've had years now, many years now to, to perfect what they do. And it's, it's, it's a craft business. And uh, they go into granular, granular detail as, as to what, what you're buying. Yeah, and, and that's good, I mean, because even though it's less with the younger generation, with the older generation, you still have like, you know, that demonization. I mean, like, you know, or your parents told you, oh no, cause you know, if you, if you smoke a marijuana cigarette, you're, it leads to like heroin addiction. And it's like, no, it doesn't. I mean, opioids lead to heroin addiction. I mean, you know, it's like, no, yeah. it doesn't. That's like saying, Oh, you know, if you drink a beer, you're gonna start drinking white lightning. No, you're <laughs> not. You may just like beer. And that's it. it. Doesn't mean that you're gonna sit there and drink, you know, grain alcohol, you know, and then you know, it's so so it's it's it, with the young generation, it's not as big a problem. But I think older generation, a lot of people that still have like all the keys to power still have that mindset of like, yeah. oh no, it's it it's it's like um I was telling my son that he said that they had um, some event. He's a school teacher, so they had some event, and um, it was it was oh, it was March tenth, which is Mario Day, M A R one zero Mario Day. So the kids could come dressed as Mario from the Mario uh, video games you wanted. And my son came in with the Kirby T-shirt, Kirby the character, and a lot of the kids were like, "Oh, you got a Kirby shirt on." Oh man. And they were talking about video games. And some of the teachers say, Oh, I used to play Kirby all the time when I was younger, Kirby 64. And they were talking about Kirby. And and my and my son was like, and I think the same thing. Um, the analogy I'm gonna make is like, he's like, Yeah, you know, 10 years ago, I don't know what's happened, but 10, 15 years ago, you couldn't do this. And I said, because you had to wait for all the old people that thought video games were stupid to like retire or die off. And then all the people that grew up with it to have be in charge of stuff and say, Yeah, this stuff is cool, why not? And I think that with the cannabis, eventually that's what's going to have to happen. You're going to have to have that generation that thinks that still believes like stuff from that movie Reefer Madness, which I seen, I saw, and I couldn't stop laughing. Um, that they have to like, you have to get that generation out of the system, and then have the young, newer generation that's like, hey, you know, it's okay. And then that's when it yeah. actually starts changing. But you still have a lot of older people. Back to my theme of having people that are too old to be running the show with that mindset of like, Oh, you know, it's, 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 it's still, it's still highly addictive. Well, not for most people. And it doesn't lead to harder drugs. That's like a lie. Um, it could, but you have to, it could, but it's not an automatic. You no, know, it's not like, it's not like you're smoking weed this month and then next month you're like out in the streets looking for on your next fix and so you don't get dope sick you know it, 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 it it's it's this mentality but yeah i saw that i thought that was really cool that george i thought that was really cool that he was like really ahead of his time because they was like in the 60s i think right that he was yeah. being a proponent yeah he uh, became very good friends with uh captain ed and, and uh jack hair who cool. wrote the, the emperor's uh Emperor has no clothes. Oh, I'm not familiar with that book. Yeah, that's like the Bible of for, for pro cannabis. I, I think it, yeah, it was Jack who uh, advocated using the term cannabis to to try to detach it from all the derogatory names that have been put on onto it. Let's no. call it cannabis and try to be intelligent. Let's have an intelligent intelligent discussion about this subject. I think we've been on for quite a while. Um, is there anything I didn't touch on the book that you want to talk about? Because we talked about the book and then we talked about other things. Well, I just feel that I've, I've honored George's wishes and I, I, uh, I think people will have a great time with this book. I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be, a, I think the people, I think there's an audience for that. Um, and, and I think um, that's what at the end of the day, find the audience is the is making a book for an audience is there that's like the main thing you kind of want to do but as well as tell a great story and have good art and keep it compelling 
So I think you've done a good job with it. The book is widely available, but if folks want to go directly to uh, the Rutgers University Press website, you can pre-order it, and that will uh, directly benefit Rutgers. That sounds good. You know what? I'll put a, in the show notes in the description, I'll put a link. And I'll, just, I'll make sure I'll do that. I'll put a link to it so if somebody sees it, they can just click on that and um, purchase it from there. But I agree. And kudos on getting um, it published by Rutgers University Press. Thank you. Um, because I have friends that are trying to publish books and work with certain com smaller, I mean, I'm not, it's worth certain comics publishers and not all comics publishers and not all people that are going to publish graphic novels are the same. So um, kudos to you for um, getting them as a, as a publisher and for having th those resources to, you know, um, refine your book with, you said, with the layout and everything else and just refine it because that is important too. You need somebody to say, you know, why don't you just do this instead? Um, and even cartoonists are established. Um, I think, um, you know, they don't do all that layout themselves. They let someone, you know, they have someone and it enhances the book. It takes what's great there and then just makes it just a little bit more. So I'm, I'm happy for you. Uh, Thank that's you. that's very uh not an easy trick to pull off so good for you but anyway hey listen thank you very much uh, for thank your you, time Ryan. and for uh, your patience with me and um i'm glad uh we reached out and we connected and you have a pleasant okay. day and best thank of you. luck thank you so much